Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about this idea of a techno-social infrastructure for the commons. It was 2009, 10 years ago, when Apple launched its campaign, there is an app for that. It seems like a much longer time. We all become so used to using our smartphones to do all kinds of things. Since then, millions of apps have been written by developers and uploaded in one of the two operating systems. The first one, Apple iOS, the other one, Android. We use our phones now not just to make phone calls, as we used to, or even to write messages, as it was initially done, but to do all kinds of things. So we use them for sharing uh, images, making films, uploading them on social media platforms. We use them as calendars, as means of keeping our work with our team. Smartphones have become portable computers, which we use for all kinds of things. Apps are small applications, which are based on the principle of cloud computing. What does cloud computing mean? It means that every time we use an app, this small program, we access a cloud, which is where we put our data, where we store our photographs, where we store a video, our files through programs such as Dropbox, and then we can access them through a variety of different devices. So it looks very nice, it's all fluffy, you know, everything is kind of up there in the cloud. But in re the reality of it is that the term cloud, uh, it's more something like this. The cloud is a centralized server farms. They are hosted in these uh, rather ugly concrete buildings, usually in cold places in the world, because they consume lots of energy, so they're very hot. This is where we go, you know, what we access every time we go to a Facebook page, every time we kind of communicate through an app. We interact with the server farms in these distant locales. So there is a cost to the cloud, an energetic cost, an environmental cost to the kind of cloud computing that we become used to. The cost is not just on the side of the servers. Cloud computing is composed of the hardware in centralized server farms, but also the hardware that we use, the personal devices, smartphones, which are constructed using precious minerals at great cost to the environment and to societies which produce them, and also end up as e-waste somewhere in the world where we don't see them. It would be a mistake, though, to think that the cloud is just this, you know, they're just server farms and personal devices. The cloud is much more than that. This is an attempt by an artist collective called the Share Lab to visualize you know, what the actual cloud architecture or platform architecture looks like. It's almost hard to see, or it's very hard to see. Like this anatomy of an AI system is the attempt to map the complex assemblage of infrastructure that underlies a popular artificial intelligence, domestic artificial intelligence uh, device such as Alexa, Amazon Echo. It comprises the whole cycle of production and exchange and consumption. It comprises many elements such as code, software, algorithms, protocols, application programming interfaces, and all kinds of uh, immaterial uh, components. Another similar thing they did with Facebook, constructing this map of Facebook algorithmic factory. These are complex assemblages. They're so complex, not, not even the companies that are running them know <laughs> what's going on. There's so many lines of code. There's so many components. Companies, advertising, bits and pieces of code, developers. This is the infrastructure, the techno-social infrastructure of our time, or at least a little bit of it. These companies are aware or at least they are starting to define themselves as providers of infrastructure. Let's look at this uh, letter, Building Global Community. It's a letter published by Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO, on his personal wall in February 2016. It is addressed to our community, uh, our community being Facebook's users, 
almost 2 billion users who connect to the platform on a regular basis, sharing all kinds of things. What does Zuckerberg say in his letter? In the letter, he says that the company is going to focus on constructing a social infrastructure for global community. He says that we live in a world where problems are global in nature, environmental crisis, migration, all kinds of issues which need global community, not just local community. He maintains in this letter that Facebook is going to change, and he did change, its mission statement into making the world, bringing the world closer together and building global community. And he will do that by providing tools that reinforce the capacity of people to form groups, meaningful groups, which can help to provide the solutions to global problems. So these companies are presenting themselves as in the business of providing infrastructures. Facebook is not the only one that is kind of focusing on this question of infrastructure. So you have all kinds of companies that have been called by critics, platform capitalists, who are all in the business of providing some kind of logistical infrastructures. There are companies with names such as Uber, like who says it provides the infrastructures that connect people with spare time on their cars with people who want to go somewhere. Right? They connect through the platform. Airbnb, Deliveroo. Like, I've seen plenty of people in Santiago cycling around with these uh, characteristic baggages on their back, delivering food. There's all kinds of companies. Some of them are more familiar, some of them less familiar, which are building these invisible infrastructures, which is allowing uh, for our social, cultural, political and economic life to function these days. This is not uncontroversial. Zuckerberg's letter, in particular, was written at the time where the company was under fire. He was accused of having played a key role in the outcome of two key political events of 2015. One was a Brexit referendum, the other one was the presidential election in the US. It was argued that bad actors had used some of the features of the platform to target swing voters and uh, you know, send them uh, <laughs> fake news <laughs> in a targeted way so as to swing their vote for Trump or for Brexit. And that's why he was called to testify in front of US Congress. At the same time, it's not just a question of bad actors, some argued. It's also the way the infrastructure, the techno-social infrastructure of the company works. So you only see posts from your personal social networks, people that you know. This so-called eco-chamber effect, or people who have similar opinions to yours. And then you're proposed by the algorithms, news that also correspond to what you think. So this reinforces what you already think and creates, according to critics, polarization. The platform was also built to maximize engagement, which means to keep people sharing, commenting, liking, and this also is said to create problems. More controversial issues or comments, you know, the ones that make you angry, get pushed up <laughs> in the list of comments, making you even more angry. The con this kind of company infrastructure that Facebook has built is not working. And maybe they might be structural. The same thing is true for the so-called gig economy. I mean, the name uh, the industry preferred is sharing economy, like, like they're sharing things. We're sh sharing a spare room. We're sharing time on our car. But again, critics who call it gig economy argue that this is an economy in which there are few permanent employees and most jobs are assigned to temporary or freelance workers. When the Deliveroo changed the algorithm in London, immediately brought down the pay for its drivers, which had no means through the platform to coordinate with each other. But they found it. They hacked the platform. 
they registered themselves as users, and then they started talking to each other. Then they organized a, a kind of a strike, and they went to the company's headquarters. And they were shocked. Like, they were not used to seeing workers. They just saw these little figures, right, running around. So they immediately had to concede. A platform can actually kick you out without giving you any explanation. Companies now are doing what national governments used to do. Chile's cyber scene project was pioneering for the attempt to construct an economy run through computers. But it was an economy run through centralized computers. The same thing happened in the USSR. In a novel called Red Plenty, which has caused plenty of debate, the story of Soviet Union attempt to use cybernetics to run the economy through computers is also recounted. So what kind of choice we have? Our choice is to live through social infrastructures constructed by brands, such as Facebook. This is their idea of global community. Or it's state socialism, the kind of social cybernetics that is administered by government, as in China. Although, again, we need to be careful be before attributing things to China that we don't know enough about. There is an alternative. Over the past 10 years, after 2008, the concept of the commons has been as undergone a kind of uh, reinvention. The Nobel Prize winner for economics of 2009 focused on how a new, the commons, which is land owned in common, actually can produce their own institution. And feminist uh, political economists such as Federici have rediscovered that the politics of the common and the way women have been central to dealing with common resources. At the same time, Marxist thinkers and the radical left have also argued that the common is also what we produce when we socially cooperate. It's about knowledge. It's about the fact that we are all involved in the production of knowledge and that the left should reclaim technology abstraction at the service of a new social project. I want to leave you now with some of the examples I know, a very quick survey of attempts to translate this idea of an infrastructure of the commons. It's not by chance that these attempts usually concern the city level and municipal level with Barcelona, for example, who has been fighting to get digital sovereignty to regain control of the city's infrastructure, which have been outsourced to privatized company also using EU-funded projects such as DECOD, where they built platforms for citizen participation and for control, again, of data. Thinking about projects such as Airbnb, platform cooperativism, the idea that workers can own the platform and decide how to use it and to share the profits. Enterprises such as the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, which has been collecting evidence and thinking about how to manage techno-social infrastructures for the common. And finally, FAIRCOP, an attempt to use blockchain, cryptocurrencies uh, in ways that stop speculation and are like democratically run through an assembly. So I'm leaving you with this question. Who will build, how will we build the techno-social infrastructures for the planetary commons? Thank you. <laughs>